My name is Dr. Sean Flanagan. I'm an otologist. And essentially what that means is I have an interest and an expertise in the management of hearing loss in both adults and children, and all the associated diseases that affect the ear and the surrounding structures, even the nerves that connect the ear to the brain. My training has been uh, based in Sydney, but I did do some additional training overseas in Italy and came back and set up a practice uh, here in Sydney associated predominantly with St Vincent's Hospital, both public and private. I also uh, consult in Miranda uh, in the Sutherland Shire once a week and have a public appointment at Sutherland Hospital and St George Hospitals and also operate once a month down at Carina Hospital as well. Whilst perhaps almost obvious, the importance of hearing uh, is essential from the very beginning of our life until the end. As a young child, speech and language development is essential. As we get through life, it is being part of the community and, and work and uh, being able to communicate with friends and family. And as we get older, there is certainly a very good correlation between uh, the level of hearing and engagement in the environment and the link with early dementia. So optimising uh, people's hearing is both rewarding and challenging and certainly very important in what we do. My practice is centred around the management of hearing loss in young children as young as six months all the way to extreme old age. Now, whilst there is a vast number of causes of hearing loss and associated diseases, I'd like to highlight a few really important uh, points and both common and important disease processes that we deal with. The first is the management of otitis media with effusion. Now, Another common name of this is glue ear and is commonly uh, seen in younger children uh, where uh, they are exposed to head colds, blocked noses and this leads to the build up of fluid behind the eardrums. Now most of the time this will clear spontaneously or with an appropriate nasal spray or antibiotics but if this fluid remains present for more than three months at a time in both ears it starts having significant impacts on speech development and also can uh, lead to the development of middle ear uh, problems, uh, scarring and affect long-term uh, speech and language development. So how do we manage this surgically? Well, um, occasionally this requires the insertion of ventilation tubes or grommets. This is a surgical procedure where we insert a small plastic tube through the eardrum to drain that fluid. Now, often in concert with this, we treat the adenoids, uh, some tissue at the back of the nose that can affect the uh, drainage of the fluid from the ear. So when these grommets or tubes do grow out of the ear, as they almost always do on their own, the likelihood of us ne ever needing to put grommets back in is very small indeed. So like any surgery, uh, it is relatively routine for us, but not for the patient involved. So it does require both del delicacy at the time of surgery, but close follow-up for the months to years uh, after the surgery to ensure that the ears return to normal function without our help uh, into the future. This is a surprisingly common condition where people can, within hours to days, notice a sudden and often catastrophic drop off in the hearing in one ear. This for us is an emergency as rapid institution of both oral steroids and occasionally injecting steroids into the ear itself can give us the best possible chance of salvaging or even returning hearing to normal. Now, it can be difficult sometimes as that blocked feeling can be the same as you might get on an aeroplane or after a head cold or some wax getting stuck in the ear. 
So both us, GPs and yourselves need to be mindful that if there's a sudden drop off in hearing, um, prompt analysis of the hearing, a hearing aid, seeing one of us is very important. Occasionally, uh, this can be the marker of a more serious condition as well. And often as part of the treatment and management, we would organize specific blood tests and even scans of the ear and the brain to rule out these serious problems. Now essentially, this is an arthritis of one of the three bones of hearing. These are designed to amplify sound as they go into the ear. And the third bone, the stapes, in fact the smallest bone in our body, can occasionally become stuck. This causes a progressive hearing loss and almost always affects the conductive part of the hearing, not the nerve. Now, this presents uh, us and you with the option of improving hearing either with a hearing aid or with surgery. Now, surgery is not for everyone, but it gives us a great opportunity to return the hearing to normal by bypassing the third bone of hearing that's stuck. Now, for us, this is one of the most delicate and rewarding surgeries that we do and involves lifting up the eardrum using a laser and a micro drill to create a hole through the base plate of that bone that's stuck. We then replace that with a tiny piston, re-establishing the vibratory quality of the ear and essentially returning hearing to a normal level. Occasionally, uh, this same condition many years later can also affect the nerve of hearing and in this particular case we would then reconsider the idea of hearing aids many years down the track. So who benefits from surgery? Well, those who are active, who are relatively young, uh, have an aversion or don't really wish to wear a hearing aid or in fact have issues with uh, irritation or retention of a hearing aid in the ear itself. Obviously these decisions are often complex and things that we would discuss in detail both uh, with your surgeon as well as an audiologist. The commonest cause of adult hearing loss is noise exposure and age. Now most of these uh, levels of hearing loss can be ameliorated or managed with a hearing aid, but also most of this can be preventable in, to some degree with appropriate noise protection and care with noise exposure um, throughout one's life. The important thing however is if the hearing is asymmetric and if this is the case this requires close and careful evaluation to rule out the unlikely but possible presence of significant underlying pathology. And essentially what I'm talking about here is making sure that there is no nerve tumor or growth on the nerve of hearing and balance. Now this requires an MRI scan in almost all cases. And if we did find something here, then fortunately, more often than not, these tumours do not grow significantly, can be managed conservatively, but occasionally they do. We detect them at a large size and require a very careful discussion regarding management, which often includes the choice between surgery or radiotherapy or often a combination of both. A very important part of our management is assessing uh, the patient who has a difference in hearing in one ear or the other. Now, most of the time, this is self-evident. On examination, we can remove wax, we can repair some minor issues with the, the hearing mechanism. But if the nerve function on one side is notably different to the other, whilst almost always not the result of a major issue, it can represent 
the presence of a small to large benign tumour growing on the nerve of hearing imbalance. And thus, anyone with asymmetric hearing loss of a nerve type, it is very important for us to organise an MRI scan to rule this problem out. If we did identify such a problem, uh, it is a condition called an acoustic neuroma or vestibular schwannoma. And more often than not, these are small, do not grow and require observation. Occasionally, this is not always the case, and the management of these uh, tumours can be complex and often require both surgery and radiotherapy options for the best possible management. And we'll cover this particular condition in more detail in a, in a later uh, presentation.